This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a very talented character actor, and I am talking about Robert Trebber. You all know Robert Trebber. He played the son of Sam David Berkowitz in the 1985 TV movie of the week starring Martin Sheen called Out of the Darkness. He also has had roles in early 80s teen sex comedy movies like Gorp, The First Time, and then later uh, he was the um, comedic villain in My Demon Lover, the horror comedy from the late 80s. He was also in uh, Making Mr. Right, and the, the guy's just done so much work, and he's got a book out that he wrote, I think it's an anti-Trump book, it's called The Haircut Who Would Be King, very funny title, very funny cover as well, and we're going to talk about all that stuff, and it's going to be spectacular, March Madness is arrived, and it's going to be a great month, February was a great month too, but this is going to be another spectacular month. I can feel it. So yeah, here is my interview with Robert Trebber. Hey, Robert. Hey, Tommy. (laughs) Welcome to the show, sir. How are you? Thank you. How are you? Pretty good, pretty good. The sun's Wait, out. You're located up up north, northern California? Redding, California, yep. Uh-huh. Sun's out, so, and I can't complain. <laughs> no, you're right. You're damn right. Compared to the rest of the country, we have it fairly easy. Yeah. Fairly easy indeed. <laughs> so you're, you, this, this is being taped now for a future uh, broadcast. For my podcast, yes. Your podcast, yeah, great. Well, so let me ask you a question first, if I may, because it kind of uh, it lied our way into my book. Go right ahead. With. Did you watch any of the uh, CPAC uh, crap fest over the weekend? Uh, no. See, I like to tuck in every once in a while. You know, I think it's important to know what the other side is thinking. Oh, of course. And, man, did you hear about this? They, they built, like, a golden idol. Golden idol, No. It's like biblical. It, they literally built, it was supposed to be a golden, uh, gold-plated statue of Trump. Oh, boy. But I think it's actually, you know, like the golden ass. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> you know, back in olden times, people, God uh, punished people who revered an idol over the truth. And that's literally what they were doing at the uh, CPAP convention. Oh, they were God. bowing down and worshiping this idol who was just spouting the most incredible garbage. I mean, you know, he, he breaks wind and they just faint with ecstasy, which, um, which, which leads into my book, <laughs> The Haircut Who Would Be King. Um, yes. I think it might be even more necessary now than ever, even though, uh, even though Biden thankfully was, was elected. Uh, what some critics said was, you know, if you're feeling depressed or you're feeling nauseous, buy Trevor's book, The Haircut Who Would Be King, and throw away your antidepressants. <laughs> so so what's, I take that as a positive. Um, yeah. I think we need to mock the guy and laugh at him even now because he's not fading away. And so hopefully your, your listeners will go to roberttrevor.net and check it out. You can read some uh, book. You can read some sections from the book. You can see other reviews. You can see some clips of me as an actor, yeah. which we can get into uh, in a couple minutes. But um, I see this book as really necessary to keep our sanity, and laughter really is the best medicine. So what's what's the genesis behind the book? Well, I started writing it, I mean, shortly after he was elected, after he took office. Like in, I started getting the idea in 2017, mm-hmm. and, and the more stuff, uh, this is called The Haircut Who Would Be King. I, I think I mentioned the title. If yeah. I didn't, um, shame on me. Um, it really dealt with the Putin-Trump uh, relationship, and that's what the book details. It actually, it's, it's a fiction, so yeah. there's a narrative structure. It's not anecdotes or just, you know, kind of stuff that they may have said. I created a structure that starts with both of them as broken children, like broken nine-year-olds. And as I say, one of them actually matured beyond the nine-year-old, 
Yeah. One of them didn't. Um, <laughs> and they were both in, in incredible uh, positions of power. And the way they used each other and thought they had a false friendship. And um, essentially I wrote it because I was really depressed after the 2016 election. And mm-hmm. to jolly myself out of it, I just started writing stuff. I mean, I've written, you know, on the, on the TV series Hercules, I would write some lines here and there. And I wrote a comedy act in New York in 1981. So I've always written. But this is just a kind of a therapy thing for me. Then I showed it to my wife. The little chapters, little paragraphs, and they said, Bob, you need to share this with people. This is really pretty damn good. And yeah. I think other people would like to laugh at Trump the way you do, and, uh, and it could help them get out of their malaise as well. Yeah. Wow. Is this your first book? Well, this is, no, I wrote a book, uh, I was commissioned to write a book when I was doing the series, uh, Hercules and Xena, called Dear Salmonius. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of, it was, it was, again, kind of like a fake Dear Abby column. I would have people like you know, Zeus, Apollo, uh, Donald Trump, ask Salmonius for advice mm-hmm. in either affairs of the heart or affairs of the wallet. <laughs> uh, and so that was published by Image uh, Trade Press, not not their comic division. And I went on tour with that uh, in England, uh, selling the book in 99 and, and 2000. Um, and this is the second published book. And I have another one uh, called, it's a, it, I call it a, an actor's unreliable memoir. And they pay you for that, which I'm, I'm looking for a publisher for at this point, which kind of details my, uh, my career from college all the way through Hercules and Xena. Wow, that sounds like it'd be a good read. It's yeah, a, it's a, so I hope, hope somebody will, will contact me about it. How did you come up with that brilliant title? And they pay you for that? <laughs> you you, you want to know? I'll yeah. tell you. I was doing, I was doing John Frank and I, have you seen 52 Pickup? Do you know 52 Pickup? Yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> with Ann Margaret and, and Roy Scheider. And at one point, uh, yeah, I play a sleazeball pornographer. Mm-hmm. You, you know, it's, it's important to have range. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm in, in a hot tub with like three semi-nude porn extras. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm getting out and we're in this porno party. John Glover is playing the character who's running the party. And there are these babes just kind of like, you know, draping themselves all over me. My father sees the finished picture. Mm-hmm. And he calls me and says... And they pay you for that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> so it really was my father. I am approaching my, my uh, deceased father, may he rest in peace, his line was, and they pay you for that? And <laughs> to which I rejoined it. And I, when I was in high school, you wanted me to be a lawyer? <laughs> so we, we, we reposted back and forth about that. Wow. So are you going to write another one? Uh, yeah, I mean, I want, I want to see if this memoir, I'm, I'm taking pieces of this memoir, actually, and I'm performing them um, for a company here uh, called the Echo Theater. I think I'm doing another one in, in a couple of weeks because they really are very personal. The first one uh, I did was a month ago talking about flying to Germany. Mm-hmm. Um, against my mother's wishes in that I'm Jewish. And uh, my mother said, you really want to go to the place where Hitler managed to kill six million Jews? I said, Mom, they're very generous and they're very um, accommodating and remorseful about what happened. I mean, Jews are doing very well in Germany now. Yeah. And my, my final point, point to her was, you know, Hitler probably wouldn't want me to come. And yeah. especially <laughs> on the German nickel, flying first class, spreading goodwill, and meeting fans, and, you know, cheering them on. But why should I accommodate Hitler? Yeah. <laughs> so I think she, she kind of bought that. So I, that's the last thing I did from this unpublished memoir. And I'm doing something else, which I won't talk about, because I, it has not been firmed up yet. But yeah. it, it'll be something to do with my working with Martin Sheen on the, uh, on the Son of Sam movie. Nice, nice. So, going back in time, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, 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 what I say is, and I think it's mostly true, uh, that I, um, it was watching Jack Lemon in the Days of Wine and Roses when I was 10 years old. My parents were pretty progressive, because I'm not sure I would bring a kid, a 10-year-old kid to the days of, this is, you know, about major alcoholism, unless they were trying to teach me some kind of lesson, like, be careful about drinking too much. But Jack Lemons, and I, you know, Jack Lemon, uh, not, not wanting to overpraise myself, like me, made, made his bones primarily in comedy. Right. But when you see somebody doing comedy who takes a sharp 
let's turn into something dramatic, it can really be jaw-dropping. And, and I, that night after I saw the movie, I couldn't sleep. I mean, I, and somehow I internalized, I want to do to other people what Jack Lemmon did to me. I want to have that kind of impact. I want to make that kind of deep emotional connection, if I can. And it was from that that I, and I started doing high, the elementary school plays and high school plays, and I applied to Northwestern, which has a famous drama department, mm-hmm. and I did a lot of, you know, so I, I, yes, I kept, I was never swayed off that path, even though I knew it was going to be extremely hard, extremely difficult to come anywhere near approaching a, a, a livable wage. Most actors either teach or, or supplement. I'm talking about union people, people who are members who have worked professionally. They can't support themselves strictly by acting. I am fortunate and hopefully talented enough that, that that's what I've done for the past 35 years. Um, right. I, mean, I, I can teach a seminar here, but I don't need an extra source of income to, uh, to keep myself alive. And I, I'm very grateful for that uh, because a lot of people say, look, I love it and I'll do it on the side, but I just can't. I can't knock my head against the wall anymore. Right. And um, uh, so I read a lot of bios of Paul Muni and other actors who said, yeah, you're going to go through hard. You're, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough, and your chances of making it are virtually zilch, making it meaning earning a living. Right. And um, uh, a wonderful Andre Gregory. You know my, my dinner with Andre? I've heard of him. That movie? Yeah. Uh, he came to the University of Chicago, and I was at Northwestern, and there was a seminar for any theater students around. And what he said was, you know, if you can find to actors or directors or anybody who wants to make theater a profession, if you can find a way to get satisfaction doing anything else, do that thing. But if you have to be an actor, if you have to be a director, then go at it full tilt, boogie, absolutely no holds barred, and make an absolute commitment, realizing your chances of any kind of financial success are virtually none. And make an absolute... I was aware. I wasn't going in starry-eyed. I wasn't wearing <laughs> rose-colored glasses. I knew it was going to be tough. And make an absolute ass out of yourself, if possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And as I say, you know, you take a pie in the face, and you can't take it personally. And the ironic thing about being an actor is, you have to be when you're hired and working. You have to be vulnerable and available and uh, resonant to all of your emotional complexities as a person. But on the outside, when you're trying to get the work, you got to have a hide of steel. You've got to have something called a rhino hide, impenetrable, unpierceable, because you're going to be knocked around and rejected, and it's hard to say, oh, they're not rejecting me, because when you're an actor, that's what they are, you know. You don't, you're not, they're not rejecting your clarinet. They're not rejecting your violin. They're rejecting you. But uh, to, to keep at it, you must have that hard, hard, you know, bulletproof exterior and keep the inside yes, vulnerable and available to, to what happens. Right. So after Northwestern, did, uh, did you go to New York? I stayed for an extra year in Chicago to get my cards. So I did, uh, I did my commercials, <laughs> and I did equity theater. I did not want to come to New York as a non-union actor. Yeah. And so uh, right out of, I mean, I was very fortunate, actually. I, I, I worked in um, uh, the Chicago Court Theater, very highly respected uh, repertory theater in Chicago during my last summer, or, or maybe the 75, I moved in 76 with my then girlfriend uh, to New York, but I made sure I had all my cards, I did commercials, and I did equity theater, and then I came to New York, yeah. Mm-hmm. And when, uh, were, were you studying acting with um, any people who went on to become successful? Studying acting? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, 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 oh, you mean other students? Yes, other students. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, by successful, I'm not sure. I mean, the theater, they're, they're successful in the theater. Um, I studied with Gene Frankel as a, as a teacher who had at one point three shows on Broadway in yeah. the uh, mid-60s. And I studied with Wynn Handman. And Wynn Handman had an incredible roster, like Richard Gere and Julia Roberts. I didn't go to class with them, but he has an incredible roster of people who went on to become famous in the business. And he ran an off-Broadway theater. So I kept studying after my uh, collegiate work uh, in New York. But mostly I hit the bricks and had a survival job. You know, I had a, a market research. I wasn't selling garbage. I didn't have to sell, you know, <laughs> overpriced uh, medical supplies. But uh, I, it was basically calling for American management associations, these top-level 
uh, personnel people or finance, like what is the financial world for the non-financial professional? There were three-day courses which these people needed to take to maintain their uh, upgrade in their company. But I was an ombudsman. I made it easy for them. M- me and like we had a bank of like 30 people at one point, and they wanted actors because we were articulate and we could keep them on the phone and we could keep them laughing. So that provided uh, income while I was working off off Broadway for Danish. You know, uh, and and trying to get an agent and trying to uh, to hack it in New York, and essentially, so I moved in in '76, and I got like some small parts in Woody Allen films like Purple Rose of Cairo, right. and I did a film with uh, Oh Rosanna Arquette's first movie, Gorp, yep. uh, which was like a low rent meatballs. Yep. So I, I got some stuff, but it wasn't enough to earn a living. It wasn't really until '85 when I did the Son of Sam movie, Out of the Darkness, with Martin Sheen, that my career started taking off and enabled me to earn a living so I could uh, dump the uh, survival jobs. Yeah, it's, it's funny you mentioned Gorp. I just talked to uh, Jeffrey Convitz a few months ago. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, you, did, you interviewed him for for, this, for your uh, series here? Yep, I did. Uh, his wife is a friend of mine. She's been on the show. and yeah. um, Who's his wife? Uh, Jill McWhorter. She was a B-movie actress in the 80s and 90s. Oh, God, you say, say hi to him for me. Yeah, he's yeah. not still in the business, is he? He still writes, you know, but um, I, it was it was hard getting anything out of him. I struggled that half hour. He's a yeah. little bitter, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> they talked to you about his, his multiple degrees. Apparently, he has both an MD, a doctorate in uh, in, in medicine and law. He yeah. had a double major. At least that's what he was telling me. And then he kind of found his way into writing, and um, yeah, I mean, he did the Sentinel, which I guess was a big hit, and then Gorp didn't do so well. Yeah, and uh, oh, I really th- haven't seen his name on too many other things. But, um, yeah, I haven't thought about him in years. Yeah. Yeah, oh, he, he did not like the way the Sentinel came out, and he's trying to reboot it and all that oh, stuff. Oh, he is? Yeah. That actually made some, that actually made some money. Gorp didn't. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, I, I, you know, in my unpublished memoir, my parents, my first movie, right, where yeah. I get, like, a main card billing, and it's a major supporting part. And uh, so it comes out in Philadelphia. My parents go to see it. It's gotten really, really, really wretched reviews. Yeah. And, my, and my dad says, well, Bob... Um, you're good. I, I don't think the films will, will be up for any awards this year. And I said, Dad, you never know. Everything else could be much worse. So um, they were they were disappointed, saying, you know, well, this could be the start of something in the film world, and it wasn't. Because I already, by that point, had made some bones in off-Broadway theater. But right. uh, this is my big film debut kind of thing, so. Yeah. And then you did another teen comedy I used to see on video shelves when I was a kid the first time. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. It was really called Goldmine. That was a much more pleasant experience. That was with Marshall Efron, Wally Shawn, who was the guy who I looked, my character looked up to, making incredibly experimental films. It was the director-writer's auto, semi-autobiographical experience of Sarah Lawrence. Yeah. You know, Sarah Lawrence was primarily a woman's school for decades. And I think he was in the first class that accepted men. Yeah. And he, he, there was a filmmaking seminar that Brian De Palma actually taught. And Brian De Palma was kind of like a semi-advisor. I'd see him on the set periodically. But it was Charlie's movie, and I played the character who played was Charlie's nemesis. Charlie's character uh, wanted to make James Bond films and commercially successful movies. Right. My character wanted to make art. Mm-hmm. You know, a hand <laughs> opening and closing around an egg. A pen that writes backwards the end. You know, th- that art, what, I, what my character pompously considered art. And uh, I had fun with that. And, Charlie, and then I worked with Charlie and my demon lover and a couple other things. I guess Charlie is, is still trying to find some new projects. But, um, yeah, the first time was fun. It was fun. It was low budget, but it was a good cast. We all had fun. Yeah. Yeah, Krista Erickson. I actually heard um, an interview she did recently. She went into journalism, and uh, she actually knew Trump, and she just she she knew when he got elected just how bad it was going to be. Oh yeah. yeah, anybody in New York, anybody who lived in New York City knew how bad it was going to be. The guy yeah. was a total grifter, fraudster, con man who didn't give a damn about anything but himself. Right. And once he became president, it went downhill from there. I mean, it, it, anybody who who had any personal knowledge of him knew that. It's just, and, and you know. Look, I make my living in show business, right? right. But if it weren't the, for The Apprentice, for show business, he never would have been elected. 
the show was popular. People thought, oh, how neat. And even though it was a made-up character, right? Mark Burnett, who produced The Apprentice, said, this is not Donald Trump. He never had a boardroom like that. He was closely held. He worked in a little room with his kid. But he, he produced all the appurtenances, and, and, and the audiences loved that. And they said, boy, maybe I could be a successful son. He wasn't that successful. He should have yeah. gone bankrupt several times, so the banks you know, wanted to bail him out. Yep. So anyway, more reason to buy my book. Check out my book again. But uh, yeah, no, Chris, uh, no, a lot of people. Uh, Lucy met <laughs> Lucy Lawless from Xena. Yep. Met, met Trump once before she was married, or maybe shortly after she was married, and it was before Donna uh, was involved with, uh, Donnie, Donald was involved with Melania, uh, and uh, Trump tried to pick Lucy up, apparently. Yeah, oh my God, it's, it's terrible. Um, you mentioned before the Purple Rose of Cairo, how was working with Woody? Well, Woody is it was quiet, really, really, really quiet. I also worked with him on radio days, but my sequence was cut out, and he sent me, <laughs> he sent me a very nice letter. i got to find some place. Uh, Dear Robert Trevor, please don't kill yourself. You were, wonderful. <laughs> you were wonderful in the movie. However, I needed to cut the whole sequence. It wasn't just me. I was playing a joke writer for a comedian who is playing at a comedy club and bombing on December 7th, 1941. Mm -hmm. The day that Pearl Harbor was bombed. <laughs> so Woody thought, in writing it, it sounded funny to him, yeah. but on watching it, it was too on the nose. <laughs> the comedian bombing and the United States being by. So everybody, and I, the guy playing the comedian had a larger part than I did, and he was, I mean, it was a whole 10 minute sequence in the writer's room, the comedians, in the thing that Woody just cut entirely out of Purple Rose. Probably for good, uh, radio days, probably for good reason. So, uh, yeah, on, on, on Purple Rose, we shot that in Piermont, so we actually boarded a bus in New York City and went to not upstate New York, but like mid-upstate New York, uh, this little town where they created this movie theater. And it was fun. It was cold, as I recall. But Woody was just incredibly recessive and quiet. Yeah. Who I remember is Gordon Willis. You know who Gordon Willis is, right? Yes. The great, you know, the Prince of Darkness, the man mm -hmm. who should have won several Academy Awards, but he underlit everything. I worked with some really, really amazing DPs. I mean, and Gordon was the first one. Gordon, because it was a large, there were a lot of extras and speaking parts and people coming out of the theater, and it had to be, you know, lit in a particular way. Gordon was like a longshoreman. Gordon swore up and down and God damn, what the fuck are you getting in there? And everybody, they all worked with him, so nobody took it personally. But yeah. he was actually creating more noise and static, but it, to good effect. I mean, it's a brilliantly shot sequence. But all the other DPs I've worked with, including um, uh, Robert Richardson and Yosef Akano and... Um, Oh God! The guy who just who won the the, the British guy who's really quite who does the Coen Brothers films. Um, they're all meticulous but quiet. But but uh, but Willis was really you know slinging it around like a blue collar longshoreman. Yeah. <laughs> but Woody was in the back. Woody was always in the back. Um, now, all right. No, I, he's apparently his his career is you know somewhat over. But I can yeah. give you a little bit of dish. Okay. I drove back. We, we all drove on a bus, but because my character like was there till the end of the evening, I drove back in the car with Woody and Mia. Yeah. This, so this is, I guess, the fourth night of shooting, and at that point, Michael Keaton was going to star in the film. Wow. Part of the guy who comes off the screen. Mm -hmm. And Woody and Mia were kind of dishing in a humorous way about how bad Michael Keaton was. Oh my and then God. a week later, Jeff Daniels was hired. Oh my God! Really? Wow! But they were very, you know, they, you know, they weren't like whispering. It wasn't like they said, "Now don't listen back there. Just close your ears." But they were just kind of like giggling how Michael Keaton was, and obviously, what he cast Michael Keaton, he thought he gave a good. But he, for some reason, when they saw the footage, Michael Keaton and Jeff Daniels was wonderful and perfectly suited um, the period nature of both the film, you know, the high-toned, Noel Coward-like movie he was in, and the nature of the audience watching the movie. 
probably better than Keaton, so Woody was right to recast him. But that's just a little bit of something that I don't think anybody has mentioned before. Michael Keaton was the original lead of Purple Rose of Cairo. Yeah, I, well, I do know this. Um, I know an actress, Kelly Maroney, she was supposed to be in um, Purple Rose of Cairo um, playing one, uh, playing the female lead. Um, not not like Mia. Like Mia's part? Not Mia, but... Um, oh, God. She, I don't think she was supposed to play Mia. I think she was supposed to play... Um, the lead in the movie, in the black and white movie? Yes, I think so. I, I well, one of the Debbie two. Debbie Rush, I think, played that. Deborah Rush played that. Yeah, you know, from New York Theater. She was probably playing Deborah Rush's part then. Yeah. And uh, she was doing another movie, and she's like one of the worst regrets of her life was that she didn't get to do Purple Rose of Cairo. But oh, she, it was a sketch. It wasn't that Woody fired her. It was, it was that she. It was a schedule conflict. It was a scheduling conflict. Yes. Ah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that, these things happen. You know. I, look, I was supposed to do Frankenheimer's Andersonville. Um, in fact, I went down to, 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 to Texas, to, uh, not Georgia, rather, yeah. to, uh, to do a week's rehearsal with him. And I was supposed to slot my uh, Hercules stuff right around then. Um, I was supposed to do a Hercules episode in New Zealand, fly back, do the Andersonville, which is going to be like two weeks' work, fly back, and then fly back to New Zealand. But they had an incredible rainstorm and Frankenheimer said look we need to keep you on salary we'll keep you on salary for two months straight it was just two months work it was not a huge part it was just like a little focal important turning point for the plot I said right. John I can't I've already signed the contracts for this other thing you knew I had this she said yeah but I can't control the so that was kind of unfortunate also because it looked like it was had the weather cooperated it would have perfectly been aligned scheduling <laughs> I mean, it would have been top <laughs> of my body New Zealand, yeah, LA New Zealand New Zealand LA Georgia Georgia LA back to New Zealand but I could have done it but uh, but this other thing so these things happen yeah. these scheduling you know, it's hard enough getting a role, letting, let alone getting two that terrific ones at the same time, and then you have to flip a coin. I know. It's, it's crazy. So without giving too much away for your memoir, I mean, how did, how did you get cast as David Berkowitz in the, Out of the Darkness? Well, yeah, um, uh, so he, he, the film was shot in 85. Mm -hmm. In 78, I was in an off-Broadway show at Playwrights Horizons in New York mm -hmm. called The New Living Newspaper. Yeah. The New Living Newspaper was based on a WPA project in the 30s called The Living Newspaper when we were in the Depression and people couldn't buy newspapers. Right? And they would actually put up verbatim sketches of the news on stage. So there was, a, there, there was a, an editor. There wasn't a playwright, per se, because all the stuff was verbatim. And it was very successful, very popular. People loved seeing the news. Before, well, I guess there were newsreels, although in the 30s, there probably were newsreels. But to see it live in front of you and seeing somebody who was killed in a butcher shop or so-and-so was running for senator, and it wasn't just bad news. But it was really popular. And this guy named George Ferenc in New York, wonderful director, mm -hmm. off-Broadway director, got a grant money in 78 if you remember uh, Carter had the CETA project you don't remember you're too young right uh, <laughs> it, was, it was actual kind of like the W pay money for artists right. money for theater artists to do projects and so he thought he went down and did some research about the original living newspaper and came up with this idea of the new living newspaper where we would take stories of the previous year and just put them on stage and there'd be uh, some musical intros, but I mean, really stark. We'd wear black and white, like newsprint, our costumes. No scenery, chairs, white wall, stark mm -hmm. lighting. So one of the stories was Berkowitz's trial mm -hmm. that year. And, um, <laughs> well, you've seen me, I don't know if you've seen Berkowitz from that time. Yes. I was, you know, pretty much his twin. Yeah, you were. I thought I you mean, yeah. Comfortably so. I mentioned that, you know, people in New York who normally, you know, crowd up on you were giving me a lot of space for the <laughs> next week. Like, well, we think he was caught, but wait a minute, because my, you know, his slash my picture was on the cover of every newspaper in New York. So uh, it, 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 uh, George said, well, obviously, Bob, you're going to place on a Sam in this, <laughs> in this <laughs> section. Here's what we've written. And yeah. uh, what they had written was not great. It was just about this guy kind of like looking comatose and going, uh, 
Stacy is a whore, which is what he actually said in in the trial, which mm-hmm. made Stacy Moskowitz's parents nuts and try to jump in. It was just very, it was flagrant and kind of overly melodramatic and did not give anything about character. Yeah. So af- after Burkowitz was caught, you know, like the year before, before he went to trial, <laughs> I said, hmm, maybe God's trying to tell me something by saying that I am an exact photo double. I guess I should do some research. Because there's mm-hmm. probably going to be a movie made about this someday. <laughs> so I did a lot of research about Burkowitz's upbringing and where well, and yada, and the, the irony is we were actually born like four days apart in the same year and the, the month I went to Northwestern, he went to Korea for basic training. It was like, you know, lives at a distance yeah. that somewhat paralleled. And I found this letter that he had written, so it was verbatim, to a platonic girlfriend back in the States. And I showed this to George and he said, let me hear it. And uh, so I did it for him. I, w- I won't do it now because you, you know, need to read the book mm-hmm. uh, when it comes out. But um, there was something I said, okay, we're going with that, Bob. <laughs> and it was that, it was a really just like a three minute monologue where you just see me on stage in a white t-shirt holding a gun, talking out to the audience. And it drove people crazy. I mean, it would it, be in a good way. It was silence and then newspaper uh, reviews came out, one of which was in the Village Voice. And again, without wanting to seem too grandiose, the review was, you know, Trevor does this incredible... Now, again, this was only two years after he was captured, yeah. or a year and a half after he was captured, and the city was still raw. And he said, Trevor is incredible. And then producers note, if you ever cast a Son of Sam movie, there is nobody, but nobody in italics, but Trevor for this part. Oh. Not only does he look like him, he really understands his twisted psychic identity. So that was written in 78. So that, that <laughs> came once they finally got it together, although Richard Dreyfus was talked about playing the part for a while, and some <laughs> other people saying, you know, agents at the time saying, Bob, you don't really have a chance at this. Then finally they decided the film would be more about the Martin Sheen character, the detective who captures the son of Sam. So they didn't need a star for the son of Sam. So I went into the producer's office. Martin was there. The director was there. I had my lines from the movie. I had the size. I said, but before I do that, <laughs> can I just give you a little piece of this theater thing that got all this attention? Yeah. And so I do it. And again, there's just like dead silence in the room. And then one of the producers said, okay, uh, can you just read a couple lines to make the, uh, from the script? to make the network geeks happy? (laughs) I said, sure, I I know the lines. So I read the lines. Martin came up to me after the audition, shook my hand, and said, I'm really, really glad to meet you. Mm -hmm. And then, like, the next morning, I got the call saying, you got it. You got the part. Wow. Yeah, you were convincingly convincingly creepy in this movie. I remember, I love it when uh, you say to him, I'm sorry you have to see this, and he, and he says, you're you, I'm me. <laughs> yeah, 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 you are what you are, I am what I am, that's, you know. Yeah. Yeah, right, right. And again, based on my, you know, in the little uh, car trip, oh, by the way, it, 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 I guess it's not online, but if you watch the whole movie, yeah. I'm being driven after the interrogation, theoretically, to major booking. Right now they were booking me in, uh, in uh, Yonkers, theoretically, but I'm going downtown for the major stuff, and as I'm being driven, with Martin in the car, and he, he's, he asks, can I do anything for you, David? And I improvise, yeah, could you comb my hair a little? It's kind of, so he pulls out a pocket comb, and then he combs my hair. And then, so that drive, that actual shot, is a practical drive, driving me to the theater where I was performing that night in a Shel Silverstein play. And I said, I have to be wrapped by a certain point. I need an hour to change gears from playing David Berkowitz to six wacky characters in Shel Silverstein's world. Yeah, when Sheen is, you know, uh, trying to detain a hostage situation on the subway, he is just dynamite. In oh, that. yeah. 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 No, Martin Martin was one of the most generous, terrific actors. I mean, he had a terrific, you know, I had a little camper kind of thing. He 
had this Airstream, you know, star thing. And he invited me into his, into his camper to go over lines, to have some lunch. And, uh, oh, and I, there, there was a review of my play, which was nice, uh, the off-Broadway play. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, uh, Mr. Trevor, we see in the New York Times here, Robert Trevor and Schultz. And he read aloud the review to everybody in the car, which I thought was really quite, quite lovely. Uh, terrific guy. I wish I could do more stuff with him. Yeah. Uh, and he's having a, a really terrific ongoing career, longevity. Yes, indeed. My earliest memory of you was when you were the clothing store guy and making Mr. Right. Oh, yeah. Really? <laughs> you, yeah. you saw that before you said 50, because 50 bit to pick up came out before then. Although yeah. I did them around the same time. I, I shot them around the same time. I was the, well, I was super young, and it was on HBO, and I happened to see it. And ah. I just, I just remember that Malkovich, you know, comes out naked and he says, is there something wrong? And you say, nothing that a rabbi couldn't fix. <laughs> right, right, right. It was all right. good scene. It was a good scene. I actually shot that. Yeah. I shot that sequence in between rehearsals for 52 Pickup and yeah. shooting 52 Pickup. Ah, those are the days I could jet around, you know, L.A. To, and they flew me first class, which was really a nice way to, to go. Yeah. From L.A. to California to Miami, back to L.A., back to me. It was like, yeah. Okay, but I, I managed to do it all. And then, uh, and it was very nice, Roger Ebert, <laughs> the late, great Roger Ebert, gave me a really nice review for making Mr. Right, considering it's like a five-minute part. And yeah. um, something like the director, Susan Seidelman, has fun populating the supporting cast with really good character actors. And then, in parentheses, like Robert Trebber as this bewildered salesman, whom you may remember from 52 Pickup. These are two very good, very different kinds of performances. So he re-reviewed me again for 52 Pickup in his Making Mr. Right review, which I thought was, you know, rather kind of him. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And then you turned villain in My Demon Lover. Well, I turned. Yeah. But originally I'm just a nebbish. Yeah. Originally I'm just a klutz who, you know, doing some physical sight gags with, you know, bowls of peanuts and tripping over stuff. And, uh, yeah, I worked with the great John, John uh, Cagliano for that, um, you know, blowing up my face. That was not CGI. They actually had to apply prosthetics and an air bladder under my chin so I'd hold my breath until my face exploded. But it took four hours to rig that. Wow. Four hours. Those things were, you know, that was only for one day. It was only that one shot because the rest of the time it was a stunt double with the horns looking like the guy from uh, uh, the uh, the guy from the uh, riots. Yeah. If you think about it. <laughs> yeah. The uh, the shaman, the, yeah. uh, the QAnon shaman with his horns. If you look at his footage and you look at some footage from My Demon Lover, I wonder if there's some influence in that because there is some similarity. That is true, yeah. <laughs> How long did it take overall to put that makeup on? The, that, that, you mean this for my demon lover? Yeah. Well, for that, that one day, it was an extra, extra four hours. Oh, okay. But my, the rest of the time, I was just, you know, pancake and some blush and some, you know, eye. No, the rest of the time, makeup wasn't bad at all. Oh, okay. It was for, now, for 52 pickup, I also had to do it because, you know, I... Like, like, that is a spoiler. I get shot through the neck in 52 pickup. And in those days, again, it wasn't CGI. They, uh, they actually had to put wires up my leg, under my shirt, up my neck, and there was a little explosive, you know, little gunpowder charge yeah. near my larynx. One-eighth charge. Then they had to mold a neck you know, chin thing, so the wires and the explosive charge wouldn't show. So to, that took about two hours to wire that up. But I was still, it's the first time I ever had that done. The biggest part I played in the movie so far. And I made sure the special effects thing, you know, this is awfully close to my larynx. Uh, there's, there's no gonna, gonna be any problem with this. And he said, no, it, most of your dialogue's finished anyway, so you, you have nothing to worry about. <clears throat> and, uh, and look, if you, if you really lose your voice, you can sue Canon Pictures. But they probably won't pay because they're not in great financial shape. So they were they were they were having some good old fun with me. Yeah. Um, but it obviously didn't damage anything, and, and it looked good. How, how was working with Scott Valentine? Scott was lovely, lovely guy. He and Charlie kind of formed a production team for a while. Uh, really nice guy, very sweet. Everybody loved him. Uh, the, the entire cast was great. 
the entire cast was, was friendly. We, either we had worked with Charlie before, the, the crew, the DP, so it was like a little family deal. Uh, I mean, the fun part was we shot the exteriors in New York City and the interiors back in L.A. So that in, in 80... And that was still 86. That was the year I did my demon, I shot my demon lover, 52 pickup, and then much of, at that time it was called Gold Mine, yeah. uh, renamed the first time. Uh, and I did some more, I, I, I was out here a lot, considering, out here meaning LA, considering I was still a New York resident that year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw an interview with him recently. He, he thought the movie hurt his movie career, and he's, he's pretty uh, upset about, about uh, being associated with that movie. With what movie? Uh, my, with, my Demon Lover? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, that's not what he said at the time. Yeah. Well, at the <laughs> time, he liked it. It changed, I guess. No, I thought he and Charlie... He was, I, as far as I could tell, we all went to the premiere. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe because it didn't make a lot of money, but, I mean, with the end product at the premiere, unless he's a much better actor than I think he is, he seemed very happy, and he and Charlie went on to form a production company. So he may be doing a little retroactive... Uh, uh, revisionism here. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Then you worked Did with. You, you interviewed him as part of your your podcast. Uh, I haven't. Uh, system here? I haven't. Inter I haven't interviewed him yet. No, yeah, it's okay. on the list. Though. I know you have some people that I've worked with, or in film, E.G. Daly, who I did the Devil's Rejects with, although I didn't work with her. Oh, you I did. I haven't. But I've worked with. I haven't interviewed E.G., but I but I do know her from conventions and stuff. I've been trying to get her on here, but she's been extremely busy. Oh, I, th I thought I looked at your uh, your uh, syllabus online. It looked like he, there was a an interview with her at some point. Oh no, there's a picture of us, but not um, an interview. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, not the actual. But I see. Yeah, no, she works a lot. Yeah, especially the voiceover artist. Yeah, you worked with Oliver Stone on talk radio. Oh yeah, and Eric Bogosian, who ironically, Eric, Eric and I, have, I, I loved his. I know we were fans of each other from the stage. I, uh, I his one man shows sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and I mean, uh, it just incredible, incredible talent. Mm -hmm. Now, it turns out, if for some stupid reason I had turned down the part of the Son of Sam op opposite Martin Sheen, because my agents wanted to hold out for more money, he was their second choice. Eric would have played the Son of Sam if I had turned it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, they, if the agents wanted more money. And Eric knew that, and yet, he still wanted to be, to be in talk radio, which I thought was really nice. Yeah, Oliver was was uh, great to work with in terms of energy, but Eric Warren, I was there for a month. I, I did the, uh, the old-time radio guy, and I did several voices. The voices of the call-in people were all taped live opposite Eric in Dallas in a soundproof room because Oliver didn't want to, you know, he wanted the instant kind of back and forth that you really can't get if you tape two people in two different places and try uh, splicing them together. So I, I got, I think I signed four contracts for that. Three, sep three separate voice, you know, one-day voice characters, mm -hmm. and then the uh, Jeff Fisher, the, uh, the main guy. Uh, but I'll, uh, Eric took me aside and said, now look, you got to know something about Oliver. Now, Eric wrote the piece, right? He won an award off, he wrote the script, he wrote the play on which it was based. Right. Oliver, so Eric says to me, Oliver comes over to me after the first day saying, we got a problem, Eric. Uh, do I have to recast this? I mean, you're not coming up with what I want. You're not coming. He, he, Oliver likes putting the squeeze on his actors all the time. And he can say it convincingly. I mean, there's no way that he's going to fire Eric Bogosian. They've already, you know, and he's the writer of the piece and knows the piece. And the, but he said, you've got to come up. You're not giving me what I need. Now, Oliver is not an acting coach, but he does have an ear <laughs> and an eye for what he wants in the character. Right. Which is why Michael Douglas, he's, Michael Douglas said somewhat, uh, somewhat of the same thing on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Oliver, he, he goads you. So after the first take, I have a few scenes in there. The one where I'm talking with Eric on my radio show, Oliver says, all right, let's cut it. Now, Bob, I said, Eric, uh, Oliver, listen, tell me what you want. <laughs> don't, <laughs> you don't have to threaten me. Tell me what you want, and I'll give it to you, okay? But, uh, yeah, okay. Well, here's what I want. And the cat, Richardson's doing his 360 and so forth. And Eric was generous. He let me improvise a few lines. Because at the end of the original script, um, if you remember the movie, 
Mm -hmm. I slapped the microphone out of Eric's hand and saying, I say, when I say cut, you stop talking. In the original script, I wimp out and saying, oh, come on, Barry, why are you doing this thing? Wait a minute, Oliver, Eric, this is my <laughs> career. This is this guy's career. Right. You don't wimp out on your career. If somebody's screwing with you, and I said, okay, let's see it. And I did it in rehearsal. He said, that's it, let's use it. So both Eric and Oliver were generous about, no, 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 so this sticks to the script. Uh, and it gave me more muscle yeah. to, to, to confront Barry, even though I'm going to lose and he's going to take over my show, I at least have to show a little testosterone saying, you don't screw around with a man's career. So uh, I was pleased to be able to get that in. And uh, Oliver otherwise was, you know, was, was fine, but I'm glad Eric took me aside saying, he threatened to fire me. So um, it just be aware, this is his modus operandi. Yeah. <laughs> you did a great episode of Tales from the Crypt. Do you remember anything about that? Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would have, well, I like being a larger part. I, I look a little chubby there, too. Mm -hmm. I lost a little weight after that. Yeah, Archie, yeah, with, uh, with what's her name? The former Mrs. Uh, Tom Cruise. Um, uh, Mimi Rogers? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, playing her agent. Well, yeah, I got a chance to get my licks in about agents, which at that time I was you know, having a problem with. I was between, I mean, they were really high on me after The Son of Sam, and then for a while I was playing a couple. I played a psychopath on Miami Vice. I played a, not a psychopath, I played a psychopath on Baywatch, the original <laughs> Baywatch. And then I played a repo man in Miami Vice that they wrote for me because says, this guy actually looks like David Berkowitz, but he's repossessing uh, Sonny's car. It's like, you know, saying, well, I can ride this for, you know, a couple more weeks. And, uh, and then those offers saying, look, I'm a character actor. I don't want to just play psychopaths. I actually made my bones in comedy. And they submitted me for some more sitcoms, which I didn't get. So I wasn't <laughs> making enough money. So they dumped me and I go for, I've been through agency uh, roller coaster dumb a lot. And, uh, and this was this was part of it. Uh, it was it was the smallest part I'd had because it was considered a co-starring part, and I, I'd only done guest starring parts. But it was yeah, I mean Tales from the Crypt. It was a, a very fun series, and it was a, it was a nice. I think it was two days or something. Yeah, my friend Jennifer Rubin was in that episode too. Oh right. Yeah. Right. That's right. So, so and Buck Henry. I'm Buck Henry. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's oh, and in fact, yeah, apropos mm -hmm. talk radio. Buck Henry auditioned for my part in talk radio. Really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And maybe he, maybe his agents wanted too money, and I was the second choice. But uh, he, you know, Buck Henry yeah, came into the Santa Ma into Oliver Santa Monica office shortly before I did. Wow. Earlier, you mentioned that um, that comedy act. So, did you try stand up for a while? No. Well, it was more like Nichols and May. It wasn't oh. stand up per se. It was like, or Stiller and Mira. It was a two-person act. And my partner, her name is Deborah Reagan, a really wonderful actress who unfortunately had some psychological things, yeah. um, problems. And she did a lot of shows. Silver, Silverstein plays also, which is how I met her. Um, uh, I wrote the material. And, um, and then we, we acted it out together. And we got some, again, some really nice work. We played Horn of Plenty, and we played Catch a Rising Star a couple times. Nice. Um, and the Improv in New York. But once you get past the flavor of the week thing, then you go into rotation, and you have to be prepared to go up at 3 in the morning. Yeah. And neither of us was prepared to do that. We're basically actors. We have auditions. We do stage work. It's not like stand-up or the com comedy circuit is our dedicated ambition. Right. It was a chance to supplement. It was a chance to, you know, to kind of like branch out and get some, went on down times when we weren't working, the chance, and a chance for me to write. Um, uh, I can give you, I, I'll just give you a little piece of a little solo. Remember the movie Gandhi? Yes. With Ben Kingsley? Ben Kingsley, won yeah. all the awards that year. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as anybody knew, there was never a theme song written for it. And I came up and, and through diligence discovered the original theme song for Gandhi that was then discarded. And it went something like this, if you can imagine me with a little turban and lots of brown skin. Gandhi! <laughs> How I love you, how I love you, Mahatma Gandhi. I give the world to be among the folks by the Gandhi River. <laughs> so that was kind of the nature of our act. Uh, it got to be like silly Monty Python stuff, which, you know, people found uh, amusing. 
for a while. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's cool. I did stand up for ten years, and I'll tell you, there were no, there were no comedy teams uh, when I was when I was doing it. You know, it's because you know my generation is is such a selfish generation. Like it always wants to be, you know, just solo. You know, I work alone type of thing. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Well, that makes it, I don't know if you've ever wanted to be an actor, actor, but that makes it tough because a lot yeah. of some stand-ups can accommodate and some stand-ups can't because they still want to be alone even if we're the other person. And both Debbie and I, in fact, she was on Barnum in Barnum on Broadway replacing Glenn Close. Both of us were trained actors, so we liked the ensemble playing off the other person. In fact, our training is, and she had, I worked with Second City for a little bit in their Saturday morning classes and their improv night stuff. Our training is make the other guy look good. Yeah. Listen, make the other guy look good. He always say yes and. Always contribute. Don't try to hog anything. So that was our basic, that's why I wouldn't stand up, man, it's a, you did it for 10 years all over or were you on did you make the circuit did you have a manager booking you places yeah oh me no i was i was mostly a dive bar and coffee house guy i did play a couple of clubs but i was mostly dive bar and coffee house you know the yeah. alternative rooms basically. it's tough i mean it's tough yeah. to do it and then it's tough to ascend and it's tough to keep your sanity i mean you better have a really good support system a good mate a good fat because that yeah yeah as any performing artist you need that but as a stand-up that's really really tough i've been listening watching richard pryor's uh, films again a man what he went through and he became oh, the genius that he became going through hell right. emotionally personally personal life but he delivered the goods and made the rest of the world laugh mm -hmm. but uh no I, in a sense I, writing this book the haircut would be king which hopefully all of your listeners will buy <laughs> and if you haven't had a chance to read it yet pick it up on amazon tommy uh that's a stand-up act i mean it's a stand-up act through a narrative structure yeah it's kind of like the book melanie chardoff has out now yeah, I, I know. I, Melanie and I worked together. In fact, you, you probably got my name through Melanie, didn't you? Well, I, I coincidental. Well, I, well I, I knew who you were already and stuff, but um, yeah, I saw that you two were friends on Facebook, so I reached yes. out. Yeah. Yes, and we worked together for the, for the Braid Theater Company in Santa Monica. Um, yeah, but Melanie's is more truthful, anecdotal stuff. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Which might be more like my unpublished autobiography. But this book about Trump and Putin is fiction. It's, it's a, it has a narrative structure that goes all the way through. Mm -hmm. So are, are you, so before the pandemic hit, I mean, were you, were you retired from acting and just focused no, on writing? No, I was working on this character, actually. I just played uh, about a month and a half ago for the Braid. His name was, Am, his name is, he's still alive, Amnon Weinstein, yeah. who is an Israeli violin maker and repairer who rescued violins from the Holocaust wow. that were both played in concentration camps and played by survivors and victims whose children inherited the violins. And he made the violins playable again. And now they are being sent to orchestras and virtuosi all over the world in that their original owners may be dead. Yeah. <laughs> but the violins speak for them. The band is one of the characters say, so I, I play the violin maker and there are other characters who play other characters in the story. And the character says, my grandmother is dead, but this violin sounds today the same way it did when she played it 45 years ago. So that, you know, it, ironically, considering, you know, some of the characters you know I played, I play the hero in this one. And nice. so I just did that. And once the pandemic is over, we did it by Zoom, obviously. But it's, oh, a, it's really, really well, <laughs> technically well done as well as artistically. We hope to take it around uh, live. Nice. It was always meant to be performed live. And, uh, you know, I did the Coen Brothers, uh, Hail Caesar, a couple of years ago. Yep. So, no, no, I'm, I'm by no means retired from acting. Um, and I was actually on a book tour. <laughs> I did, the, I did the, cha the Pandemic Chasing Bob book tour. Mm -hmm. I literally was in San Francisco and Seattle in February, mid-February, late February, then went to New York City the second week of March, then went to my hometown. I was going, and then the, everything shut down, like, days... <laughs> After I appeared yeah. in, in like four cities, and I was supposed to appear in Philadelphia, my, my hometown, my birthplace, um, and I, literally the downtown area was closed 
two hours before my signing. Mm -hmm. So that's the most immediate thing I was doing last year. And then a couple, years, a couple months after that, we were supposed to do a live production of The Violins of Hope. Uh, any of your, your fans, you, you can't watch it because, again, this is like privileged material. We, we did it live, then we did one repeat, but they can see the documentary about this guy, The Violins of Hope, and I look nothing like him, but he looks like Lech Wenza, actually, um, but uh, hopefully I captured his spirit and his heart, yeah. and he said he was very, very pleased with the, with the work. Um, so we're doing that, and uh, there's a couple other projects that I'm writing for myself. I'm yeah, you know, I'm, I, I'm not really hot to go out. Well, you, I mean, you can't go out for an audition now. I mean, nothing's really shooting, uh, except in Canada. And uh, I'm not crazy about self-auditioning. I, I, like, I did not self-audition for Hail Caesar. I met the Coen brothers in person. Everything that I've gotten, I basically met the director. They've got to get a measure of me, not just how you can see how I look on my, on my reel. Yeah. I've got plenty of stuff on my reel. I've got plenty of credits. I want to meet you. I want them to meet me to see where the deal is, where the chemistry is, where, how we can work together. And, and thankfully, I'm at that point in my career where I don't need the money. I don't lead a luxurious lifestyle. I, have, <laughs> I rent in a rent-controlled place. We got two Toyota Priuses. I have a lovely wife. I have a lovely life. I get lots of free uh, DVD. I'm a member of the DGA also and the Emmy, so I get lots of free screeners and once we go back to movie theaters. But when I want to do a project, then I can do it. But I don't have to, you know, scrounge for anything that might come my way for some kind of part that can help pay the rent. I'm very grateful for that. It's a very privileged position, both to earn a living at it and to be able to somewhat pick and choose. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely not retired, nor was I um, at the beginning of the book, book tour. Yeah, sorry. It's just that sometimes, you know, IMDb can be inaccurate, you know, so that's well, why. Well, I mean, also don't put theater stuff. <laughs> Yeah. They, don't, they don't print theater. I've been doing a lot of theater. I mean, even aside from this one, I worked with The Brave. We did a show called The Art of Forgiveness. I mean, I've been doing a lot of theater. Mm -hmm. That's good. You're in Los Angeles. That's good. I was, yeah. I, I was curious. Back in the day, did you did you did people ever confuse you with Charles Levin? No, but funny you should mention that. Yeah. I think he was with my first agency, which was good for a couple of years, uh, for a year and a half until they dropped me because I wasn't making enough money. Um, I know him. He, he, is he still alive? He died actually a couple of years ago. Um, I thought so. He was missing. I thought so. He was missing for like a week, and then his his son found him in the woods in, uh, up in Oregon or something. Yeah, uh, it was some kind of hiking accident or something. Something like that. Yeah. God. It was. Yeah, we're about the same age. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know. I knew him. That good guy. Good guy. I knew him back in like when it was seventy eight, seventy nine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I'd see, because I'd see him like you know, for instance, play the Moyle on Seinfeld, and I'd go, "Is that Robert Trevor?" And then I see, "Oh, it's Charles Levin." I get oh, you too oh, confused. Oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, no. no. <laughs> then for a while, I mean, it, there was some semblance resemblance between me and Belushi. In really? Fact, I auditioned <laughs> for the movie of Wired. At the same, which was you know based on Woodward's book, yeah, and the movie was really crappy. They they created like a, an angel of death. It was like Michael Chiklis and Ray Sharkey. The, the book kind of moved yeah. through the problems of the Chateau Marmont, and and I auditioned for it, and they wanted to call me back, and I said, "Has the script changed at all?" And they said, "No." I said, no, "I'd prefer not to." <laughs> and then it was Michael Chiklis who played the part, and the, and the film played like a week and then died, and it's never been repeated anywhere. But again, <laughs> that's one of those missed opportunities for the project because I thought the book was damn good, and as someone in the business, it resonated to me about the lifestyle and how easy it is to get seduced, and people tell you how great you are, and you start eating your own publicity, and you're expecting, and one of the nice things about the way I was raised as a middle-class Jewish kid mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. I mean, for about, I don't know, 10 years from like 52 pick up on, whenever I do a product, I'd be flown first class, first class hotels. In fact, I did a, what the hell, oh, commercial for Long John Silver's, and um, I was put up at the Sunset Marquee yeah. in, in West Hollywood, and the concierge said, oh, so nice to see you again, Mr. Trevor. How is I had never been there before. I had been at the Chateau Marmont. I had been at, but I mean, this, this obsequious kind of lovely and the, the swag bags and the gift baskets and everything. And then it ends. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't feel I have to keep that up. 
I don't have to bankrupt myself by paying for first class myself. It was really nice while it lasted. And, and it will happen again at some point. And all throughout uh, uh, Hercules and Xena, for five years, I was flown everywhere first class. And I was flown to conventions. And I was flown to Germany. I was flown to um, uh, England three times. First mm-hmm. class. Given the first, It was lovely. I celebrated it. I'm not going to knock it. I'm not going to say, oh, no, no, I'm not worthy. But I'm not going to say, well, now I am due. Now I am due to get this because this is where I've been. And I know some actors who, I won't mention names, who have done this and have come closer. They always fly first class. They always eat the most expensive restaurants because they want to be seen as still being extremely successful. It hasn't really improved their uh, job opportunity as far as I can tell. But I'm glad, glad I was raised with basic values. You know, love yourself. Love your immediate family. Hopefully you've got a good partner. I've been with the same woman for 40 years. Congratulations. What other temptations came my way on the convention circuit? I have signed several breasts. Um, I was not sexually harassing anyone. They were proffered to me, saying, please sign this, uh, twice in England and once at the Comic-Con in San Diego. So it's like mm-hmm. that clear in the Me Too generation. Um, Didn't I see uh, that uh, you, have a, you have a Comic-Con appearance coming up? I don't. Oh, okay. I had one online. Oh, okay. I had something called Happy Time Pop Com. Uh, but there, no, I mean, the Zena, they, I don't know when the, con- you know, hopefully, God damn, I miss, I miss both performing live and mm. I miss being part of a live audience. Yeah. Deirdre and I, my wife and I go to theater a lot out here and we see movies at the DGA and it is more, I'm very happy to be able to do it online and Zoom and TV, but there's something about that group experience. Yeah. I, I know that it's scheduled now for like December, I think, of this year. Now they may be pushing it back to 20th. It's really hard mm-hmm. to get, and we don't know what the variants are going to be, these mutations of COVID. Um, I'm available. I mean, you know, when it's safe. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I, th- that treatment and getting the star treatment is great, as long as you don't take it too seriously and feel, look, I knew part of being an actor was a roller coaster. Right. I'm just glad that my, my investments and my residuals and my royalties and stuff allow me to lead a very pleasant lifestyle without having to be forced to take a job I really don't want. Spoken like a true actor. I mean, did you read somewhere that I'm up for it, that I'm being considered for a, a, a con? Yeah, I thought I saw an advertisement for it. Maybe it, it passed already. I don't know. But I think it was online. I, it, was, it was Renee, Renee Witterstatter's uh, con. And I, I uh, again, I Zoomed some stuff and I read some stuff and I sold a couple books and uh, uh, Dear Salmonius and, um, and a, an artwork that some guy did for me. It was Doug Schuler. You know Doug? No. He's really good. I, it was like a, a charcoal pencil sketch thing. Really good. Um, I know. Uh, I know. That must have been what it was. Yeah. I know a couple con promoters, but not a whole lot of them. Mostly for the horror genre. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I did. I did Devil's Reject, so I got some. I, <laughs> I got some cred <laughs> there. Um, and if you, uh, if you, if you watch the Devil's Reject director's narration. Um, mm. Again, I came up with some stuff that Rob liked, uh, and I put it in about Otto Preminger and said, this guy really, because I was the comic relief in a very dire, sordid, brutal film. He felt it was necessary to give the audience a chance to breathe, and he said some very nice things about my work. And he was great to work with, with Zombie. Mm. I mean, very professional. Didn't, you know, none, none, none of his rock stars, he knew exactly what he wanted. He yeah. communicated clearly to the actors. He was appreciative that I knew all my lines and that could come up with something. Very professional guy. I, I talked I mean, to. It may have been his best film, actually. Because the subsequent Halloween uh, sequels were not that great. Yeah, I, I talked to Michael Berryman, and he told me Devil's Rejects was the only movie he did not want to talk about. That, that, that Berryman didn't want to talk about? Yeah, I don't. I think that um, him, and, um, him and Rob Zombie were mad at each other about something. Oh. I don't know. What it well, is. maybe he thought he had more. Yeah, his part wasn't very large. Maybe, maybe he was cut, cut out of it more than he thought he would be. Maybe I, I, I don't know. But he told me he said, "Don't mention Devil's Rejects." And I was like, "Okay." Ah, interesting, <laughs> interesting. It still is. I mean, I, I, you know, I can. My, my wife can't watch it at all, and so I just show her my five-minute sequence in the middle. But uh, it's a hard film to watch. But there is a kind of. <sighs> artistic, cohesive integrity about it. And it makes mm-hmm. you question, well, who's the bad guy? Is it Wydell? Is it uh, the, you know, is the sheriff? I mean, how 
much evil do you have to incarnate in order to fight evil? Which is kind of like a substrate of the, of the, of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I want to see the new one, Three from Hell. Um, I, didn't, I have I, seen it. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I did get yeah. to meet Sid Haig at one of his last conventions. Right. It was actually, I think it was shown fat, or it was shown last, you know, it was shown before COVID as a fathom thing. You had to buy a, a pre, and they showed, I saw it on the, I saw the Devil's Rejects. It was a double feature of the Devil's Rejects and Three from Hell. Um, not great. Yeah. <laughs> it's not great. And Rob is, I don't know if it's in the writing or he, or it just, he, it, it's not great. I was disappointed. I, I like the people. And she's, she's mm. sexy, although she's, you know, pushing it, age-wise, she's pushing it a little bit now. I mean, you know, yeah, his I, wife. In, in my opinion, I don't, I don't think he wanted to make a third one. I think he wanted to stop after two. That's why it, it yeah. took so long to make the third one. I think he was under a lot of fan pressure, and that happens a lot these days. And I think it's, it's wrong, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Well, it happened to Coppola, right? Yeah. <laughs> he didn't want to make Godfather three, and um, you know that had some very interesting moments, especially about the Catholic Church. But uh, no, three from hell. I mean, I had had he asked me, I probably would have done it. But, uh, you know, let's bring back the, the, uh, the movie critic guy. But, um, no, it was, it was disappointing in a kind of ersatz, you're really not adding anything new to the story. Right. So uh, the, the book is called The Haircut That Would Be King. It's available on Haircut Amazon. Who Would Be King. Yes. It's available, go to Robert, it's available on Amazon. But if you don't like Amazon, it's available on all the um, uh, online sites. And you go to Robert Trevor. Dot net r o b e r t t r e b as in boy o r dot net and you can see the book you can buy it there you can read the reviews you can also click the about tab and see me play the son of sam and uh, and also salmonius the salesman and as i say in the book having played a psychopath and a salesman gave me great foundation to write about donald trump mm -hmm. because he is kind of the intersection of the two <laughs> absolutely and uh, let my listeners do the math, but I was born the day before your 30th birthday. I realized, oh, really? I realized that, yeah, as I was doing research. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that was actually two years before uh, the Son of Sam film uh, came out on CBS. Interesting. Yeah. Really, how did you see you saw it online? Yeah, the Out of the Darkness. You said you saw the whole film? I, I saw that movie on Lifetime like 15, 20 years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. With commercials. With commercials, yep. Yeah, it's even, it's even better without commercials. I don't know if you, yeah, I think it, may, it may be available on Amazon or something. In any, in any case, you can see some, some of my clips with Martin that, uh, you know, that kind of uh, sprang me forward in terms of a career jump. Yeah, and at the end of the... I, it, it, it's funny, you know, all this darkness in the movie, and then at the end he goes to a Mexican party and they're having a jig. <laughs> no, 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 Italian, Italian, yeah. not Mexican, Italian... Oh, it's Italian? Okay. Absolutely. It's produced by Sonny Grosso, and mo most of the people that... Uh, and Zigo was Italian. The character that Martin played was Italian. That's so right. They're, they're singing an Italian song, not a Mexican. And it was shot in, in Puglia's downtown in Little Italy, one of the famous, great Italian restaurants where we had our rap party for the movie. And they're all singing like, uh, uh, it's a Tarantella. It's not, it's not, it's not a uh, Mexican restaurant. Oh, okay. I, I, was, I was always confused when I was younger, so it's been a while since I've seen it. Now you got to watch it again, the whole thing again. <laughs> and, um, yeah, no, it's, it was a really good film. I think it won some kind of award from, like, a Christian faith. You know, if you have faith, the idea is Martin Sheen's wife is dying, and he doesn't want to be on the team to capture the son of Sam. And then once she passes, his priest says, now you have a job to do. Yeah. apply your talent and it was that character Zigo who did the grunt work which helped to capture the son of Sam who a lot of people thought would never be captured yes I'm going to watch it again because it's been a long time yeah yeah but uh, I thank you so much for coming on today Robert yeah it's a pleasure man so when, you'll, you'll give me an email about when this can be available to, uh, to listen to yeah by the, by, by the end of the day today it should be ready okay. and so I'll, I'll uh, email you about it very good it's been fun. 
It's been fun. Please stay safe, and um, and I'll keep my eye out uh, for your pro- upcoming projects, and uh, absolutely even check absolutely. out the book. Please pass me along to anybody else who might like to, you know, sample because I'm re- I, my, my, I, I still think my book is relevant now, especially because every time that Trump appears in the news, people glom on, and he still has a lot of support. And this book needs to be a palliative for the rest of us. Wonderful. Well, you stay safe okay. and have a great day. You too. Okay. Bye bye. Well, there you have it. Robert Trevor. Ain't he a cool dude? Oh, he is funny. He's got great stories. And he's passionate about what he does. And it was an honor to talk to him today. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.